Today I'm talking to Karen Davidson Taylor all about bees. She is on board at Pollinator Guelph and she is the education officer at Royal Botanical Gardens. She has talked to children in many countries around the world, taking them on virtual field trips to beautiful gardens. Hi, Miss Davidson Taylor. Hi there, Robert. How are you today? Great. Happy Don't Step on a Bee Day. <laughs> I read that every third spoonful of food we eat depends on pollination. What foods would we lose without bees? Well, we lose a lot. We lose a lot of our fruit. We lose a lot of our nuts, our seeds. <laughs> We'd lose things like squash, strawberries, raspberries, apples, oranges. We'd lose so many different things. What we wouldn't lose is things like grains, so wheat. So if you wanted to eat lots of porridge, you'd eat that. But you wouldn't have milk necessarily, and you wouldn't have honey, and you wouldn't have eggs, because all of those things are dependent on animals and those animals are dependent on those pollinators. So there's some direct dependence and there's some indirect dependence. And for instance, squash, like all of the pumpkins, the gourds and the squash, they all have a very special relationship with hoary squash bees. So, you know, there are some plants that really do depend on certain pollinators for for uh, developing the fruit and constant oh, and and stuff like that so there's a lot of stuff that we depend on how do bees help the food what happens is that if you're going to get an apple that bee has to go from one flower to another flower and when it does that it picks up stuff called pollen on its those are small sticky grains and it will stick onto the hairs of the bee and then it will be able to take those and when it goes from one flower to another it will take those pollen grains from one flower and as it's getting nectar from another flower those pollen grains will get wiped off onto a special part of the flower called the stigma and that will then be the beginnings of the fruit. So that pollen has to travel down that tube until it gets to where the eggs are. And that's what's inside that little fruit right there. So those bees are critical for that fruit development. Cool. Is it really true in order to produce a kilogram of honey, a bee needs to visit 4 million flowers and fly four times the distance around the planet? Is there anything else that bees can do that is important? Well, they can do a lot of things. And I have to be honest, I, I don't know a lot about um, European honeybees because they're not native to North America, but they are a very important agricultural resource. But I do know, though, that bees have to make a lot of trips, whether they're honeybees or wild native bees, to get the nectar and the pollen. And if our wild native bees, they actually use the nectar and the pollen to make something called bee bread. And so honey and bee bread are used to feed the larva or the young. So I was on the Pollination Guelph website. Here's something that I've discovered. One pound or half a kilo of white clover honey represents, now get this number, 17,330 foraging trips. So that's a little bee going out and coming back, going out, coming back, going up. And that would be equal to 8.7 million flowers. And it would take those bees about 7.2 hours of labor to make one pound or half a kilo of honey. Wow. So that, I mean, yeah. And here's the other thing is that there are little tiny bees that can only travel as much as, you know, 200 meters because it takes a lot of effort to travel. So there are little tiny wild bees that may travel only 200 meters to get to their next meal. But something like a bumblebee will travel, you know, 2.5 kilometers and be okay with that distance because it's so much bigger. So you know, the size of the bee makes a big difference as to how far it can travel. 
And that's why, you know, it's so important that we make sure that we've got habitat close by so that those bees have some place to get the food that they need when they need it. Well, apart from pollinating plants, they're also food for other animals. So they could be food for birds, they could be food for mammals, they could be food for all sorts of other animals. And that is what's important is that they are part of that food chain or food web. So, you know, people just think of them being pollinators, but they also have, you know, other roles. And, you know, because of what they do, as I said, they're very important for biodiversity. Without them, this place would be a very different planet. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., bee colonies per hectare have declined by 90% since 1962. Some areas of China, bee populations have dropped so much, people have taken over doing the pollination work by hand. What is happening to bees? Why are they dying? Um, a lot of research has been done on the honeybee because it is a very important agricultural resource. But you know what's interesting is that not a lot of work and a lot of data or a lot of information has been collected about our wild native bees. So we don't know a lot about the numbers and we don't have that sort of proof that things are in distress. What we do have, though, is that there's been a lot of work done on bumblebees. And in one particular bumblebee is the rusty patch bumblebee. And what they've discovered is the numbers have gone down so severely is that uh, the range or the area where rusty patch bumblebees are now found has decreased between 70 and 85%. So imagine, imagine they have, they were in this much space 30 years ago. Now it's reduced to this much. So that's pretty bad. And their total population numbers have gone down by 95%. So that's why the rusty patch bumblebee is on the IUCN, is on the red list of species at risk, a very important list. So I wish I could say, oh, we know exactly why this species of bee is having a hard time and this species of bee is having a hard time. But the honeybee has helped us learn about some things and so has the, uh, so have bumblebees helped us learn. One of the things and one of the biggest ones is habitat loss. And so, you know, Every time we build a home, we build a road, we build a factory, every time we do that, we're actually taking away habitat that's important for bees and lots of other um, animals and, and plants as well. Um, but not only that, we're also separating that habitat. So if there was a habitat, if there was a sort of a great big piece of habitat right here, and we put a road right in the middle of it, First of all, we're removing that habitat was there as it was in the middle, but we're also separating two areas of habitat. So imagine if there was a little tiny bee, remember that little tiny bee can only travel about 200 meters and a lot of roads, you know, it could be much bigger than that considering sidewalks and homes and stuff like that. So when we separate the habitat that also makes it very difficult for them. Um, climate change. I know that's a big thing for you. Climate change is also something because what's happening as uh, the weather and as the climate is changing, when insects are migrating north, when they're coming out of their nest in the spring, when flowers are opening, that, that's changing. But is it changing at the same rate for the flowers? and the insects. And that's one of the problems. Uh, another thing is herbicides and pesticides and all these chemicals some people apply to stop weeds or stop pest insects. And that's a really big problem because not only are we stopping the pest insects, but we might also be causing damage to beneficial insects. Not that people perhaps do that on purpose, but they might do it by accident. The other thing also is that sometimes herbicides that we put into the plants, such as something called neonicotinoids, people will do that to protect the plant, to make it grow better, but that chemical is now 
in the plant. And when that animal goes to get the nectar and the pollen, those chemicals are in there as well. And it's causing problems. Competition. As much as honeybees are important, they're also competing for resources with our native bees. So we've got to watch out for that. Greenhouses. They have to use pollinators in those greenhouses and they might use honeybees, they might use bumblebees, they might use blue orchard bees. And bumblebees and blue orchard bees, those are native bees. But these are now commercially produced. And what's happening is that they might be, they might escape from those greenhouses. And unfortunately, they will um, perhaps bring with them when they escape into the wild areas or the natural areas, they may bring with them diseases or pathogens or fungus that's not good for our wild bees. How do bees help encourage biodiversity? That's actually related to pollination. Bees, when they go from one flower to another flower, what they're doing is pollen has got some very special information in it that when passed on to another flower is going to give that flower traits that are going to help it be a stronger flower. And that's the thing about biodiversity is if we had a hundred Roberts versus a hundred different people, all those hundred Roberts would all do the same thing. Whereas those hundred different people would do different things and act differently and have different ideas, but the hundred Roberts would all have the same thing. And so the hundred different different people would be a stronger situation. There would be more diversity in that group. So the more diversity there is in the group, the stronger that group is. Giving that next plant some qualities that will help it survive um, in different situations. I'm talking mm -hmm. to you from our new pollinator garden on top of our new bicycle shed, but we have mm -hmm. not seen any bees there yet. We do have a nest of mud bees there. Are they important too? What sort of plants do you have on the top of your bicycle shed? Do you know? I have mm -hmm. bellflowers, honeysuckle, coneflowers, bee bombs, delphinium, foxglove, English lavender. You actually have 60, 40 horticultural plants or ornamental plants and a smaller number of native plants. And one of the reasons why you may not be seeing as many bees, because some of those probably are going to flower later, uh, it, it might be just a titch too early for some of the bees to be visible. And remember, those bees are also kind of small. So, and some of them even look like wasps. Some of them look like flies. Um, it depends on the bee itself. Native bees will, will tend to go to their native flowers, wildflowers, simply because there's more nectar and it's better quality nectar in those flowers compared to some sort of ornamental or horticultural varieties. Foxglove, that's not a native plant, but if anything's going to visit, it's going to be a bumblebee that's going to visit it because it's nice and big and it can get right in there. It sounds like you've got a nice variety of plants. So you've got plants that have sort of tubular flowers, you've got plants that will be flat. So they've got a landing platform, which is what bees will need. It sounds like you've got plants that would be suitable for short tongue and long tongued bees. Um, it sounds, but, but the more native plants you have, the better it will be for, for those bees. Um, and you also mentioned that you had, you saw some bees in mud or in earth? Was it in soil? Yeah. There are ground nesting bees. There are lots of ground nesting bees and those little bees um, will, um, they'll dig down into the, into the earth and they'll make little sort of galleries almost. And that's where they'll, they'll put a little bit of bee bread, which is nectar and pollen. They'll put that in sort of the little nest and then they'll lay their egg and then they'll close it up. And that's where that little, so the egg will eventually hatch and the larva will start eating that bee bread, but that's okay. Now, the one thing I want to ask you is, do you know, is, is that where the earth is? Where Did you actually see them going down in there? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I also see them coming out. There are a lot of ground nesting bees, um, and they really do depend on the ground, including bumblebees. Most bumblebees nest underground, um, and they'll create these little colonies, and it will be just the queen bee that gets it all started in the spring. And she does all the work. She creates these little capsules and fills them with bee bread, lays the egg, and then eventually those eggs will hatch into workers, and then they'll be able to do the work and she'll be able to just get on with laying eggs. But I think with your roof guard, you've got a good variety of plants, but I think if you can find more native plants, that might be something to do. So asters would be a good one, especially because they're going to be good for later in the fall and pearly everlasting. Uh, and for the spring, uh, prairie smoke. No <laughs> friends. Yeehaw, Chowing, and Teshring in Bhutan would be proud to hear that Bhutan has led the world in adopting a 100% organic farming policy, which means they use no chemical fertilizers or pesticides. How can kids in other countries help their governments make similar changes? Well, if we're talking about helping kids to get information to governments, the first thing is start local. Is there someone in your local government that they're doing a planting project? Maybe the kids could, you know, be involved with a planting project. Are they using pollinator friendly plants? Do they have to use this chemical? Could they use mulch instead? Connect with organizations like Pollination Guelph like you're doing right now, helping people become more aware. And then you just go a little higher. Maybe that local person, that local politician can help you talk to somebody provincially, perhaps help you talk to somebody federally. So you get higher and higher. And so that's one thing that, that you can do. And the other thing also is by doing what you're doing, you're just helping people become more aware. And people will go, oh, I had no idea. We have to do something. You never know how much a small change will impact. You know what they say about a stone going in the water and the ripple? You are the beginnings of those ripples. Is there anything else kids can do to help save bees? It's always good to learn more about the bees. Um, what you could do is keep a little journal or do an inventory. A lot of um, entomologists, people who study insects, do inventories of their area. Um, that's how we learn what bees are around and what other insects are around. So you could do something like that. You could take pictures of the ones you see. Um, I don't know if you've heard of iNaturalist. It's an app that I really like to use. And all you need to do is take a picture of a bee or an insect that's visiting your flower. And then you can submit that. And what's really good about it is that information, um, it will say, it will ask you to compare it to other insects. It will tell you what they think it is, but there will be lots of people that are entomologists, are ecologists, and they will sort of say, okay, yes, it is this. And, you know, it, they'll share that information with other scientists. So you can help be a community scientist. I mean, the more gardens we have, if we can help put back those gardens, put back those plants in those constructed areas, that would make a, a big difference. Would it be crazy to say bees keep the planet healthy? No, and you're absolutely right. Bees are bees are just one of the things that keeps the planet healthy. And when we talk about, you know, because they are critical to food, not only for us, but for, you know, lots of other living things. Um, without those bees, it would be a very different thing. So they need our support 100%. What do you wish more people knew about bees? That there is a huge variety. We think of bumblebee and we think of honeybee. That's it. Yeah. But there are so many different types of bees and they all need different things. They need perhaps different types of flowers. They need different uh, things in their habitat, different things for the shelter. Uh, we're not the same, nor are they. So that's a really important thing. And that there is something that we can do 
Thanks so much for joining me today, Ms. Davidson Taylor. And remember, together kids can save the world. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks very much for having me.